Imperial Rome, a familiar topic, which many of us apparently think about with great regularity. The empire is well known to us, and well defined. Its leaders and politicians, its technological advances, its military might, its religion and the customs of its people. However, what is less clear to us is the world beyond Rome's borders, particularly in those regions where there lived so-called uncivilized barbarians. Perhaps in no other place is this more the case than in the northern reaches of Europe, beyond the Danube, in the dense forests of Germany. Here lived a vast array of tribes, who, in the imagination of many Romans, were a savage and warlike people, ready to launch assaults upon the empire at any moment. One name can be seen with great regularity in the Roman sources, Suebi, or, as it is often rendered in Latin, Suevi. If the name seems familiar, it may be because it is, for it was this group of Germanic tribes which lent its name to the German region of Swabia. But who were the Swabi? Were they simply yet another violent group of forest-dwelling tribesmen intent on Rome's downfall? Or is there more to this little known people? Today we will discover just that, and attempt to answer the question, who were the Swabi? Firstly, before we dive into the details of Swaby culture and history, we have to discuss the difficulties we face in defining the Swaby themselves. Unlike many of the border peoples Roman writers speak of in antiquity, the Swaby were not one single tribal group. Rather, they were a larger group of Germanic peoples, made up of a number of smaller tribes, some better defined than others. Of course, like all slightly obscure historical peoples, our understanding of them is defined by the sources that survive. As the Swabi had no written records of their own, we are dependent on what Romans like Julius Caesar, Tacitus and Strabo wrote. And naturally, their view of the Swabi was itself defined by the fact that the majority of Swabi-Roman interactions came about in the context of war. How each Roman writer defined the Swabi differs markedly, at times quite dramatically. For example, Julius Caesar actually referred to them as a single people, placing them within the larger classification of Germanic peoples, a group who at the time were expanding southwards to the banks of the Danube. However, later Roman authors, including Tacitus, Pliny the Elder and Strabo, referred to the Swabi as a larger ethnic designation, within which there were a number of distinct and identifiable tribes. Strabo, the Greek author of Geographica, written sometime around the turn of the 1st century AD, clearly considered the Swabi to be a larger collection of tribes. He mentions the tribes of the Swabi, and explicitly refers to the Semnones as being a tribe of the Swabi. He also assigns the Hermondori and Langobardi, or Lombards, to the wider Swabi group. Now, as for the tribe of the Swabi, it is the largest, for it extends from the Renus to the Albis, and part of them even dwell on the far side of the Albis, for instance, the Hermondori and Langobardi. Tacitus too, writing over 150 years after Caesar, around the year 98 AD, is clear in his opinion that Swaby is a more general attribution describing a group made up of a multitude of tribes. We have now to speak of the Swaby, who do not compose a single state, like the Cati or Tentere, but occupy the greatest part of Germany, and are still distributed into different names and nations, although all hearing the common appellation of Swavi. Defining the geography of the Swavi is, for the reasons just mentioned, rather tricky. Furthermore, as a loose group of tribes, the Swavi would not ever have possessed clearly defined borders as we in the modern world understand them. That said, our Roman authors often describe where the Swabi dwelt. Julius Caesar, the earliest to write in detail about the Swabi, asserted that they lived around modern Hesse, east of the Ubi tribe. However, Caesar's location is perhaps to be viewed with some skepticism. Julius is the only one of our Roman sources to describe the Swabi as being a single tribe, rather than a larger group of several tribes. In this vein, his purported location of the Swabi is suspiciously similar to the location which later authors describe the Chatti tribe as inhabiting. 
Of course, while it is possible that the Suevi moved between Caesar's time and the period in which later Roman authors penned their accounts, it also seems likely that the people Caesar was describing as Suebi were in fact the Chatti, or possibly even Semnones. As would be implied from the name of Strabo's most famous work, Geography, the Greek author describes the location of the Suebi in some detail. We can refer back to this quote that we saw earlier. The Renus and the Albis are the Rhine and the Elbe rivers, respectively, allowing us to place the bulk of the Suebi between the banks of these two rivers in central and southern Germany. The geographer Ptolemy, writing in the mid-2nd century AD, also described the Suebi as inhabiting the lands between the Elbe and the Rhine. Strabo gives further details on the boundaries of Suebi territory too. He states that the Gabretta and Hercynian forests, two vast ancient woodlands, were controlled by the Suebi. The Gabretta forest is generally agreed to refer to the Bohemian forest, or the Shumava mountains in central Europe, between modern Germany, Austria and Czechia. This would tally with information that Tacitus gives us regarding the borders of the Suebi, in which he describes how the ridge of mountains in Moravia, Hungary, Silesia and Bohemia separate Suevia from various remoter tribes. However, the Hercynian forest is a little harder to place. Stretching across western central Europe, from northeastern France to the Carpathian Mountains, and covering much of southern Germany, it is unknown exactly how far the forest stretched eastwards. Although it is thought that the Black Forest, extending east from the Rhine Valley, formed the western end of the Hercynian, this would also tally with what Strabo says in a separate section of his geography, in which he writes about the Rhine. He described the Suevi as inhabiting the eastern bank of the river, suggesting that the vast swathe of Germany occupied by the Suevi stretched as far west as the Rhine. In any case, the dense Hercynian forest formed a natural boundary of the Roman Empire, both politically and culturally, in the minds of antique authors. To the east, Strabo is unclear on exactly where Suebi territory terminates, aside from noting that the Hermanduri and Langobardi form the boundary of what might be considered Suebi lands. Tacitus provides us with a little more detail, describing how the Semnones, the oldest and noblest of the Suebi, live on the Elbe as far east as Suevus River, which may be the Oder in modern Poland. Interestingly, Tacitus's Germania actually hints at a further northern boundary for the Suebi. Tacitus actually defines the borders of Suevia as being the lands where the Sitones dwelt, a people only mentioned in Tacitus, who likely lived in modern-day Sweden. To this end, Tacitus also refers to the Baltic Sea as the Suevic Sea, stating that the peoples who lived on its banks shared their customs and dress with the Suebi, although he admits that the language of the Aesti, on the eastern bank of the Baltic, more closely resembles that of the British. This makes Tacitus's definition of Suebi territory a vast one, covering an enormous stretch of central and northern Europe. To what extent such a great number of separate tribes with differing languages could be considered part of a single Suebi identity is perhaps debatable. Although Tacitus does not directly describe peoples such as the Sitones and Suetones as Suebi, his allusions to Suebic identity on the basis of customs and dress are interesting and are attributions not made by any other author. However, it is likely that Tacitus is using the name Suevi to simply refer to Germanic peoples as a whole and includes a region in which there live tribes who could not be described as Suebi, or even Germanic in some cases. The word Suebi was attributed to so many Germanic tribes by 1st century AD authors that for a time it looked like Suebi might actually replace Germans as the most common name for these peoples. Like all the Germanic nations along the Roman border, the Suebi were seemingly quite adept at warfare. In fact, Caesar called them the largest and most warlike nation of all the Germans. He notes that, from childhood, the Suebi engage in healthy diets and daily exercise, resulting in men of vast stature of body. Interestingly, Caesar notes how they refuse to allow the import of wine into their country, on account of its ability to degenerate the ability of their warriors. Suebi society was divided into 100 cantons, 
from which a yearly levy of 1,000 warriors would be sent abroad raiding. Furthermore, Caesar records that the Suebi for the most part shunned fighting on horseback, preferring instead to ride to battle and dismount in order to fight. Strabo too attests to the military prowess of the Suebi. He notes how the tribes who dwelt in the region of the Rhine, such as the Sicambri, the Nervi, the Treviri and the Menapi, were driven out by the power of the Suebi and forced onto the western banks of the Rhine, presumably a process that was driven by force of arms. This is a story corroborated by Caesar, who wrote that the Usipets and the Tegteri, after suffering defeats at the hands of the Suebi, were driven into the Rhine region. Their migration in turn forced the movement of the Menapi further beyond the Rhine. However, Strabo hints at the defeats suffered by elements of the Suebi too, stating that the Hermondori and Langobardi, both Swabic groups, had largely been driven out of their country beyond the Elbe and onto the southern banks of the river. Clearly, even the most fearsome Germanic groups were not immune to military defeat. Aside from their various clashes with Germanic tribal groups, the Swabi had a number of clashes with the Roman Empire. In 58 BC, the Swabic king, Ariovistus, crossed the Rhine in his campaigns against the Edui tribe, who appealed to the Romans for assistance. Refusing to return to the Rhine, Ariovistus remained in Gaul, looting and pillaging. Julius Caesar led six legions to repel the Swabi threat, defeating Ariovistus at the Battle of Vosges in September of that year and forcing the Swabi back across the river. Once again, the Swabi clashed with the Romans in 55 BC. In a similar narrative to the 58 BC conflict, a tribe allied to the Romans appealed for help in resisting Swabi raiding. This time, the Germanic Ubi requested aid from Caesar. In typically bold fashion, the future dictator bridged the Rhine with incredible rapidity. This was achieved by driving piles into the river two feet apart along the width of the river. These piles were then braced by thick beams before being laid over with timber, allowing Caesar's army to cross. Such was the panic that this induced in the Suebi that they reportedly abandoned their settlements on the eastern bank of the Rhine and retreated into the forests. Caesar, considering his point to have been made, returned to the western bank. Brief mention of a 29 BC crossing is made by the later Roman historian Cassius Dio. He asserts that the Suebi crossed the Rhine, presumably with the intention of raiding and looting. This party was roundly beaten by the proconsul Gaius Carinus, who incidentally also served under Julius Caesar in 45 BC. By 9 BC, the successful campaigns of Nero Claudius Drusus had expanded Roman influence across the Rhine frontier and deep into Germany. According to Suetonius, the Suebi submitted to Drusus. Roman writer Florus provides us with a little more detail, describing how the Cheruski, Suebi and Sicambri forged an alliance against Roman expansion, but were defeated by Drusus, with many Suebi being sold into slavery. However, Roman expansion into Germania, which appeared to be inevitable under Drusus, was suddenly ended in the summer of 9 BC and the autumn of 9 AD by two sudden events, the death of Drusus in a riding accident and the disastrous Roman defeat at the infamous Battle of Teutoburg Forest. This catastrophic defeat of the Romans at the hands of an alliance of Germanic tribes led by the Roman-educated Arminius checked Roman encroachment across the Rhine. While it is possible that some Suebi participated in the battle, the primary Germanic combatants were northwestern Germanic tribes, the Cheruski, the Marzi, the Chatti, the Bruteri, the Chaudi and the Sicambri. Tacitus mentions how after the defeat of 9 BC, the Romans made peace with a powerful Suebic king known as Maribodus. Although it is also worth mentioning, some sources refer to Maribodus as specifically Marcomanni. Tacitus details how Arminius, fresh from his victory against the Romans, attacked Maribodus on account of him hiding in the forests rather than joining his fellow Germans in their struggle against the Romans. Reportedly, the Semnones and Langobardi abandoned the Suebic king, preferring instead to serve the victorious Arminius. But while the kingly title rendered Maribodus unpopular with his countrymen, Arminius aroused enthusiasm as the champion of liberty. The disgraced Suebic king fled to Ravenna 
dying there in 37 AD, having never ventured to return to his native land. Over a century and a half later, the marker Mani, a Germanic people identified as Suevi by Tacitus and Strabo, initiated a series of conflicts with the Roman Empire, in concert with Cadi, Vandal and Sarmatian allies. The exact reason for the beginning of these conflicts is debated, with climate change and overpopulation both being cited as potential theories. However, it is perhaps most likely that the political and military pressure placed on the marker Mani and their allies by large-scale southward migrations of peoples such as the Goths, who around this time began moving southwards from their homelands around the Vistula, precipitated the Marcomanni Wars. The upshot was a series of conflicts in which the Marcomanni, who had previously enjoyed amicable relations with Rome, launched large-scale excursions across the Rhine and Danube frontiers in 166 AD, likely with the intention of settling in Roman territory, concluding in 180 with a peace treaty between the Marcomanni and Rome. These wars saw fierce fighting, both within Suebi territory and the borders of the Roman Empire itself. Owing to the slightly disparate nature of the hard-to-define Suebi, there is a deal of debate regarding which language or languages they might have spoken. However, it is generally agreed the Suebi would have most likely spoken a Germanic language, or several Germanic languages. Tacitus's description of the various peoples that make up the Suebi, such as the Semnones, the Langobardi and the Marcomanni, implies that there was at least some regional variation in the Swaby tongue. Philologist Oren Robinson associated the Swaby with a group of Germanic languages known as Elba Germanic, so named because of the location of their speakers in the region of the Elba River, stretching south to the Danube. Sometime in the late classical period, these Germanic dialects to the south of the Elba underwent the so-called High German consonant shift a sound change which altered a number of different consonants from the related words in English, Dutch and Scandinavian languages. For example, voiceless stops became fricatives in German. English ship, Dutch ship, Norwegian skip versus German schiff. Therefore, it is thought that modern Swabian German may have, at least in part, evolved from the language that the Swaby spoke in antiquity. It is also likely that the dialects of the Swabi influence Bavarian, the Thuringian dialect, and the language of the Italian Lombards, and finally, modern High German itself. Julius Caesar himself provides us with a vivid picture of Swabi culture, describing their seeming disinterest in cultivating cereal crops. Caesar tells us that the Swabi subsisted on a diet that primarily consisted of animal products, obtained through animal husbandry and hunting. However, Caesar is disparaging the Swabi's cattle, considering them far inferior to those of the Gauls, those poor and ill-shaped animals which belong to their country. The Swabi diet would therefore have consisted of animal meats and milks, and the skins of these creatures also provided the Swabi with their clothing. Such an economic system apparently meant the Swabi had little by way of export products, and therefore traded little with their neighbours save for the spoils of war which they gained through plundering. Interestingly, the concept of private land ownership did not exist amongst the Swabi, at least not according to Julius Caesar. In fact, this communal spirit seemingly extended to wartime too. Swabi warriors, we are told by Caesar, took turns going abroad in war parties. One year an army will be sent out campaigning, and the men who remain at home will maintain the families of those who are at war. The next year, those who previously stayed will campaign, and the others will remain at home. Furthermore, as implied by their lack of agricultural production, the Swabi seem to have lived in a somewhat nomadic, pastoral fashion. The Roman historian Strabo described them thus, They do not till the soil or even store up food, but live in small huts that are merely temporary structures, and they live for the most part off their flocks, as nomads do, so that, in imitation of the nomads, they load their household belongings on their wagons, and with their beasts turn whithsoever they think best. One especially unique element of Swabian culture, which is noted in numerous ancient sources, is a hairstyle, the so-called Swabian knot. The Swabian knot is described in detail in Tacitus's book on the origin and situation of the Germans. It is a characteristic of these people that they turn their heads sideways and tie it beneath the pole in a knot. 
by this mark the Suevi are distinguished from the rest of the Germans, and the freemen of the Suevi from the slaves. The pole customarily refers to the top of the head, so the Swabian knot would have been a knot situated on the side of the head. It is not simply Tacitus's text that describes the Swabian knot either. There are many examples of this style in sculpture, jewellery and art from antiquity. Furthermore, bodies found preserved in peat box have been discovered sporting this particular hairstyle, most notably the Osterby head, found in 1948 in southern Germany. In fact, Tacitus's text tells us that the Swaby were extremely keen on their tonsorial fashion. He describes even the older Swaby as tying their hair into knots atop their head, and the Swaby chieftains paying special attention to their knotted hair. They decorate themselves in this manner as they proceed to war, in order to seem taller and more terrible, and dress for the eyes of their enemies. Evidently their neighbours considered the hair of the Swaby to be fashionable. Tacitus notes that the youth of neighbouring tribes would often wear their hair in the Swaby fashion, in a classic case of imitation. It may not surprise you to learn that the Swaby were pagans. Although their rites and traditions no doubt varied amongst the disparate peoples whom we refer to when we use the word Swaby, the sacred grove, wooded groves of trees which held special religious significance and were sometimes held to be the dwelling places of gods or other spirits, appear to have been ubiquitous amongst the Swabi. Tacitus details the way in which the Semnones people would bind themselves with chains upon entering their sacred groves in a symbolic act of acknowledging their inferiority in the presence of their gods. If a Semnone was to fall within the grove, they would not rise to their feet, presumably because rising in the presence of the divine would be deemed sacrilegious. Instead, Tacitus tells us that the Semnones would instead be forced to roll out of the grove itself. In contrast, the Langobardi, or Lombards, specifically worshipped Mother Earth in their groves, the chief and most revered amongst which contained a consecrated chariot covered with a veil. Only the high priest was permitted to touch this chariot. The coming of the goddess to the sacred chariot spurred great religious festivals according to Tacitus, at which point the chariot is drawn by cows throughout the country to great fanfare. Sacrifice too was a key element of Swaby religion, just as in Roman religion. However, Tacitus reports with great horror on the practice amongst some Swaby, namely the Semnones, of engaging in that most barbarous of customs, human sacrifice. At a stated time, all the peoples of the same lineage assemble by their delegates in a wood, consecrated by the auguries of their forefathers and ancient terror, and there, by the public slaughter of a human victim, celebrate the horrid origin of their barbarous rites. Of course, the Swaby were not immune to the advance of Christianity in late antiquity. Following their great displacement westwards during the migration period, the Swaby who settled in northwestern Spain in 409 apparently converted to Christianity relatively quickly. By 448, their king, Rechiar, was a Christian. However, this conversion took some time to filter down to the general populace, who remained pagan for some decades more. It would seem that by the 460s, a Visigothic missionary by the name of Ajax, sent by the court of King Theodoric II, converted the Swaby to Arianism. Sometime later, likely in the mid to late 6th century, the Swaby eventually converted to Orthodox Trinitarianism. Without delving too deeply into theology, Arianism is the now heretical belief that Jesus, while being Son of God, is not co-eternal with God, i.e. Christ was begotten or made by God. It is debated exactly how the Swaby converted to Catholicism, but by the 589 Council of Toledo, in which the Visigothic Kingdom of Toledo officially converted to Catholicism, the conversion of the Swaby seems to have largely taken place. The minutes of this council note that an infinite number of Swaby have been converted. Of course, religious conversion of an entire population is a long and almost unquantifiable process, so any exact date must be taken with a pinch of salt. As asserted by Strabo, the Swaby were apparently predisposed to the nomadic lifestyle. Strabo's assertions in this regard were borne out in reality some four centuries after the Greek author penned his text at the turn of the 1st century AD. Although the Great Migration Period, also known as the Barbarian Invasions, which eventually ended the Western Roman Empire 
could be said to have begun as early as the year 300 AD, it was not until 406 that Swaby had a major part to play. It was on the 31st of December of that year that a large group of Swaby, Alans and Vandals crossed the Rhine en masse, launching an invasion of northern Gaul which would permanently destabilise the Western Roman Empire. The shock of the crossing was enormous. Likely propelled westwards due to political pressure from the expansion of the Huns further east, the Swaby and their allies invaded the empire, looting vast regions of northern Gaul and precipitating the usurpation of Constantine III in the province of Britannia and leading to the eventual abandonment of the province by Rome. While some Swaby remained relatively close to the Rhine, moving southwards into modern Switzerland and Austria, a number of them also settled in Pannonia. Most notably, a large group of Swaby under King Hermeric continued to move southwards and westwards in the political vacuum that followed the 406 Rhine crossing. Reaching the Pyrenees, they crossed into Basque country, eventually settling in northwestern Spain in the Roman province of Galicia. Their appetite for destruction apparently satisfied, in 410 the Swaby swore fealty to the Western Roman Emperor Honorius. In the process, Galicia became the first of the sub-Roman kingdoms to be formed during the slow disintegration of the Roman Empire in the West. Lasting until 584 AD, the Swaby underwent drastic cultural changes after settling in the Iberian Peninsula, including settling in rural farms and adopting the local language. Although a few traces of their old Germanic tongue remained, most notably in some place names in Galicia, such as the village of Suevos, abandoning their Germanic paganism in favour of Aryan Christianity in the 460s, the Suevi eventually became Catholic in the 560s. The final defeat of the Suevi came at the hands of the Visigoths. Growing Visigothic power in central Spain led to incursions into Suevi territory in the 570s. The king of Suevi in Galicia ruled an ever-shrinking territory confined to the extreme northwestern part of the Iberian Peninsula, before they were finally subjugated by the Visigoths in 585 and their lands incorporated into the Visigothic Kingdom.